know, we've been looking at Moses' account of the creation as God gave it to him, written down in Genesis chapter 1. And today we're going to be looking at day 6. We're already at day 6 of creation. And what happened on day 6, the second half? God made man created man. In fact, even in the book of Revelation, it says six is the number of man. Seven is the number of perfection. Moses was also the human author of Psalm 90. A lot of people don't know that, but Psalm 90, Moses wrote, and in Psalm 90, verse 12, he wrote, teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. I mean, some of the people with the least common sense can have a lot of facts crammed up in here. There's a difference. It's knowing how to use that wisdom and learning from mistakes, that, or that knowledge. That's what makes wisdom, learning from our mistakes. Two verses earlier in, in verse 10, Moses wrote in Psalm 90, our lives last 70 years, or if we are strong, 80 years. If we're just downright stubborn, we go on and on. I don't know. I'm just adding that. I don't want to get in trouble there. But even the best of them are, are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. Now you're looking, that's not very encouraging. I mean, these, that sounds like woe, to, woe is me, gloom, despair, agony on me. But we have to remember that our pain and suffering is not God's fault. Any there are in the world is not God's fault. We're the ones who brought the the fallen world, the fallen creation by our own disobedience. Now, you know, it actually takes quite a lot of energy to live. Think about this. If you live to 70 years, you will see 25,500 mornings. During that time, we'll spend 23 years and four months sleeping. We will work an average of 19 years and eight months, some more, some less, We'll spend 10 years and two months in recreation and worship doing those things that we really love to do. Six years and 10 months are spent preparing food, eating, and drinking. Six years are spent in transit, traveling. An average of four years are spent in illness or recovering from illness or injury. And finally, we spend two years of our lives bathing and dressing ourselves to face the world each day. And again, for some people, it's far more. For some, it's unfortunately far less. Anyway, it's no wonder we're so tired all the time. So now last time we began our look at day six of creation with God making the livestock in the first half of that day, the creatures that crawl, uh, the wildlife of the earth, each according to their kinds. You remember that? But God has saved the best for last. And most women here would agree with that statement because God created woman after he made men. Amen, ladies? Some say God looked at man and says, I can do better. And worked on the ladies. Now, though before Nancy, one of my old girlfriends in college used to pronounce amen, she pronounced it ah, men. Every time she saw a group of fellas, she would say ah, men. And that's the primary reason she's not around anymore. Amen. All right. Let's read what the Creator had Moses write down beginning in Genesis 1.26. As always, even though we have it up here, I encourage you to look in your own personal Bibles if you brought them, highlight certain things. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth. Everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. In other words, God gave us salad. Thankfully, he also made a few thousand islands and a few ranches. Thank you. I appreciate those of you who responded. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. 
evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. See, God not only created us to enjoy a rich and meaningful life, he created the world to be a healthy, safe place, a storehouse that was filled with everything we would ever need for as long as we would need it. And God saw all that he had made, and he says it was very good indeed. Think about it. No need for doctors. No need for medicine. No need for nursing homes, police, soldiers. I was thinking, I kept thinking, oh, there's no need for counselors, lawyers, undertakers. No need for cemeteries, graveyards. There's absolutely no need for kings, queens, prime ministers, presidents. No Congress, no parliament. For God's word was written on the hearts of men. Hallelujah. God had created the paradise. And we had a purpose to fulfill within that paradise. And it was good. We can't even imagine what that was like, but living in the world we do today. Now, when God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, what did he mean by that? First of all, you notice he said, uh, he said, let us make man what? In our image. You see, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all present and accounted for at our creation. They were all there. The God the Father is the creator. God the Son is the Savior. And God the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live and to serve him on this earth. Some of you have wondered the purpose of the Trinity. There it is. God the Father, the creator. God the Son, the Savior. God the Holy Spirit empowers us to live and fulfill our purpose on this earth. But Rick, what does that mean? To be created in the image of God? That's an intelligent and insightful question. Well, first of all, we have to look at what God says taken as a whole, taken in context. Okay. Try to stay focused over here. He says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God immediately follows that up with this. Stay, stay focused. Says, they will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. As far as the animals are concerned, we are like God to them. You and I are like God. Like God, we've been gifted with creative minds, a will, emotions to fulfill our role as his representatives on earth. We represent God on earth to the animals. We have dominion over them. I talked about that last week as God has dominion over his entire creation. We have been placed in a position to care for the animals. So in that sense, we are created in the image of God. Got that? But in another sense, we're created in the image of God in sinless perfection. See, some people, when they say we were created in the image of God, they think, well, God must have a body. You know, God must have facial features. Remember uh, the Sistine Chapel, some of you seen pictures. Has anybody seen the Sistine Chapel in person? Been allowed in there. So you got to see the, 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 that one. You know, it's amazing. You know, I've seen many, many pictures. Of, of course, we have that little picture out here in, the, in the, the welcome area out front, you know, where the finger of God is touching, you know, the finger of man. You can almost see the spark. Almost see the spark, you know. And remember, uh, the, the Pope asked Michelangelo when he saw the picture, is that how you see him? <laughs> you know, is that how you see him as an old, wizened, white-haired, majestic figure? Well, the Bible says no man has seen God, but the Bible also says in John, God is spirit. Christ was God in the flesh, but God is spirit. Now, like God, we have been gifted. We have this, this mind. We're created in the image of God in sinless perfection, not physically like him, but like the angels, we were also created to be immortal, not eternal because you and I had a beginning. God is eternal. He alone is eternal. The rest of us, we are immortal spirits. He originally created us to enjoy everlasting fellowship with himself from our point of creation. As the Bible says in Colossians 1, 16b, all things have been created through him and for him. It's been create, we've been created for his purposes. Indeed, the entire earth, along with every living creature, was created in a sinless perfection, a paradise. God loves us. We are his most cri prized creation. That's why he made us last. And even the angels have been given charge to watch over those who love and serve 
the Lord. Now, I would not want to go up an a against an angel in mortal combat, okay? But still, they have a purpose. They are designed to look over us, to watch over us, to serve us. You can see this in Psalm 91, 11 through 16, if you want to write that down and check that out later. Psalm 91, 11 through 16. Now, in return for all God has done and provided, he's worthy of our love. He is worthy of our protection. I mean, of our, of our affection and of our worship. Now, but for that love to be worth a plug nickel, it needs to be offered back to him freely. It needs to be offered freely to him. Being loved by someone is awesome. Everybody wants to be loved, no matter how hard, how tough they think they are. Inwardly, we are desired, designed and wired to be loved. I love Nancy, I love my family because I want to love them. I know nearly all there is to know about them and I still love them as they do me and I love them and, and they love me of their own free will and that's the way you want it to be with your own family. God would have us love him in that way, freely, of our own accord and so he gave us a free will. Fully understanding what could happen and what would happen. Speaking of angels, even they have a free will. And the scriptures indicate that one of God's mightiest angels, swelled with pride, lost his place in heaven. You can look at some passages, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. The Bible says a third of the angels were led astray and fell with him. This is mentioned in Revelation chapter 12. And most likely, these are the demons that we deal with on a daily basis. Okay, That fallen angel, in the form of a serpent, appeared in the paradise that was Eden. He took advantage of, of man's neglect to take the word of God seriously. And Adam and Eve freely chose to go against God's loving commands. If this is not hidden in our heart, I mean, what did David say? I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not. And just that little neglect. Did, I mean, whenever Satan planted the, the seed, did God really say you would die? And that you can almost see Adam and Eve looking at each other or, or Eve looking over to Adam wherever he is. It says he was with her. I said, did he really say that? Just that moment, not being certain of what the Word of God said is so dangerous for a child of God, a, a Christian, a person who claims to know Christ, to not know the basics of this book through and through and to be able to defend the truth we will fall for anything. We've got to be wise enough. That's part of wisdom is to know the, the word of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Adam and Eve freely chose to go against God's loving commands. Now as parents, we lay down boundaries for our children, don't we? Children are not supposed to cross these boundaries, and we do it out of love. We don't do this because we're all about ruining their lives. I want to make their life as miserable as possible. That's not why we do it. We lay down these barriers out of love for their protection. Don't go out in the street on your bike unless mommy and daddy are with you. Remember how it starts? Stay away from the stove while I'm cooking because I don't want you to get burned. It's hot. I didn't listen when I was a kid. I reached up there in a pan of frying bacon and eggs. That was dumb. Have I ever done it again? That was the beginning of some wisdom for me. Came with a stupid act. Always wear your seatbelt. Then is that growing? Hey, be home by nine. Oh, mom, be home by nine. Do not have sex until you are married. Dad, you can't say that. Just don't. To the kids, these commands sound more like a dictator than love. But as, as adults, we know better because we've been there. We've already know for ourselves the dangers, the pitfalls, and the consequences for every rule that is broken. Every boundary that's crossed when God says, thou shalt not, he is protecting us from serious harm out of love. And the same is true for mom and dad. The fifth commandment of the ten says this, Honor your father and mother, and it's the first commandment with a promise. It says, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. When kids disobey, like all of us, kids pay the price. Even when they think, you know what? Mom and dad never found out about that thing. 
You know, so hey, even some of us adults remember, you know, hey, mom and dad never found out about this or found out about that, but we still paid for it, didn't we? You know, they, they might think they're, they're getting away with it, but it's already catching up to them. They just don't know it yet. The Bible promises this. Numbers 32, 23b says, be sure your sin will find you out. It's going to catch up to you. So when Adam and Eve disobeyed God's single command to be obedient, the consequences were swift. And just as God had warned, they instantly died spiritually. And eventually, they had to die physically as well. The fellowship with their heavenly father was broken. In fact, until every human being has placed their faith in the son of God as their Lord and Savior, they are still spiritually dead. That's not me saying it. That's the word of God. And they're headed for the punishment designed for the devil and his angels. Hell was designed for those who faced God every single day. They saw him. They saw his glory. And they still sin by turning away from him. They had no excuse Hell is their punishment. Hell's been designed for them. Any human that goes there goes there on their own free will. Adam and Eve had lost their physical immortality. Their bodies would eventually die and go back to the dirt. Uh, the Bible makes it clear that the penalty for sin is death. Both physical death, spiritual death. But, and one more thing. Adam and Eve's disobedience brought the loss of paradise. They, they had been enjoying. How many young people have either been forced to leave their homes out of continued disobedience or they said, I'm out of here. They head out because they think they know better. They don't like mom and dad's uh, rules. Mom and dad are just too strict. And many of these young people would one day think back to how good they had it <laughs> whenever they were under their parents' love and care, when they weren't getting bills with their names on them. You know? You can look at Luke chapter 15 there and read a story about that. Now, according to Romans 8, 19 and 22, it says all of creation fell. All of it. All of it fell into the mess that it has become when men chose to rebel against their heavenly father. Now you and I are forced to live in a fallen, messed up world by our own free will. And that's why Moses wrote, our lives last 70 years, or if we are strong, 80 even the best of them are struggle and sorrow. Indeed, they pass quickly and we fly away. But here are two of my favorite words. But God. <laughs> I love that. But God still loves us. Just like the prodigal in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son's daddy loved him. And he kept waiting for him, kept looking for him to come home one day, to come to his senses and come home. But God, it says in Romans 5, 8, proved his own love for us and while we were still sinners. God loved us. Christ died for us. It's been a while since I shared this story, but when I was 14 years old, remember Uncle Harry, Dad, came up to put a new roof on our house there in Sauk Village and brought Grandpa George with him. You know, it's my step-grandpa after my first grandpa the preacher passed away a few years later grandma married a man named George and he came up to help put on that roof and we had a little awning uh, I've, I've been to the house recently when I went up there uh, not too long ago and I saw you know it's still there there was a little awning uh, over a little patio out front well that awning in that time was rotten the planks had to be or the the dry what's that called the sheetrock whatever plywood had to, the decking had to be replaced. Thank you. The decking had to be replaced, but it was real rotten. And we we're working our way, you know, over that area. And my grandpa George says, "Now, Ricky, you need to stay away from right over there, over that over that patio, because that's rotten there." You know. So I'm working along his side, working side, bringing him shingles and helping him. He'd show me what to do and everything. And then I started backing down in that area. And sure enough, I heard. Ee -ee -ee -ee. You know, he reaches out and he grabs me, you know, on, by the collar. And he goes, now, Ricky, <laughs> you know, I wasn't paying attention. I hadn't listened. And there I was. I was about to drop through that rotten wood, you know, down to that patio. That might not have been good. Because we are sinners, we are slipping. We are falling into a very real place prepared for the devil and his angels called hell. It exists. 
but God still loves us enough. He is willing to reach out and he's willing to offer his hand to everyone who will take it. He offered his own son to die in our place, a free gift. He is willing to keep us from falling into that place. In fact, right now, if you are lost, if you have never trusted Christ, it is only the hand of God under you that is suspending you and keeping you from tumbling headlong into hell at this moment. That's how real it is. It's his grace. It is his love. And you challenge it with every breath without trusting him as your Savior and Lord. He could pull that hand out at any time and let you go. It is only his love and grace that's keeping it there. The moment we place our faith in Jesus Christ to save us, our Heavenly Father begins another glorious process, restoring us into the sinless, perfected image that he had originally created us. We are being restored to the image of God. We fell from that sinless perfection. Now the process, when you trusted Christ, he began to work on you again. Restore you bit by bit by bit back into the image of God. We are becoming little Christs. We are becoming Christians. Every day we spend in this word, every time we spend in prayer, every time we spend under the teaching of the word and worshiping, there's chiseling going away. A little more chiseling, making us more into the image of Christ. Little Christ, the great sculptor, Michelangelo, did the Sistine Chapel. He's also a sculptor. He didn't think of himself as a painter. He says, I'm a sculptor. He said there was a hidden character within every block of marble. And his calling by God was to chisel that character out, to find that character. And if you've ever seen any of his, of his masterpieces, oh my goodness, Moses, they said, was so lifelike. There's a little chip on the knee where they said that Michelangelo when he was through. He took his hammer and he hit him on the knee and said, speak! Because <laughs> he thought, man, he looks, he looks like he could just speak any moment. Oh yeah, every day God is chiseling away our flaws and our imperfections and it hurts with every swing of the hammer, doesn't it? It hurts, but God is revealing a bit more of the character he intends that we become. There was a missionary in the Philippines uh, who was visiting a school for silversmiths. And while he was there, there was things that he could purchase and he looked and a, and a money clip caught his eye. It had a particular design on it that just called out. He says, I got to have that. So he purchased that money clip and he carried that with him as he was a missionary in the Philippines for 24 years. One day as he slipped a few bills into it, it cracked and it broke. So he made a point. The next time he was in the area of the Philippines where that silversmith shop was, he, or school was, he stopped again. And sure enough, it was still there. So he walked in, there was a silversmith standing there and he, he laid the two pieces of the money clip on, on the, the table there in front of him and says, uh, I bought this here 24 years ago and wanted to find out if there's any way that can be repaired. Said so the silversmith took it and he flipped it over and he saw that design. He says, I made this money clip. I am the only one who did this particular design. I made it. Of course I can fix it. God made you. There's stuff wrong with all of us. He can fix what is, needs to be fixed, okay? Now, you and I are still going to die physically if the Lord does not come back because the penalty for sin is death. But he can fix us spiritually. Oh, and by the way, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The first to do that in preparation for all of us he is the first fruits. He is the first, and all of us will rise with our brother someday. He, he's fixed that. He's prepared us for that as well. If we've trusted Christ as our Savior and Lord. Amen? Isn't that good? He's preparing a place for us in the new heaven and the new earth. Paradise once lost is going to be paradise restored. But this time, it's not going to be God in the spirit. It's God in the flesh. Jesus Christ will live and breathe and walk in the new heaven and the new earth and you can talk with him every single day. I intend to take advantage of that. We can all do that. No more struggles, no more aches, no more pains, no more sickness, sorrow, pain or death. Hallelujah.